Greetings. In this lecture, we are going to do our best to cover the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation is another one of those books where you could spend the whole semester just working on it alone. But we are especially going to focus on the first six chapters. I figure if you get the first six chapters of Revelation, you basically get Revelation. And to start with, we are going to talk about occasion and purpose and genre. So put some notes together. Let me share these with you. So the approach to Revelation that we're going to take is to remember that Revelation, like all the other documents of the New Testament, has an occasion and purpose to it. And so we want to think about, okay, what was going on in the world that prompted John to write Revelation? What was his goal in writing it? So just like we would with Paul's letters, just like we did with the Gospels, we want to know what the occasion is, what the purpose is, where the book of Revelation came about. And so we think that the general consensus is, there are a few divergent views, but the general consensus is that Revelation was written around 95. And this is the time that Domitian was the emperor of the Roman Empire. And Domitian demanded that he be worshiped as Lord. And so he was rather uh, radical about this. Uh, emperor worship was common, uh, but what made Domitian different was his persecution of those who would not worship him. And so it led to intense persecution against the church, against Christians, uh, because Christians confessed that Jesus is Lord and the emperor wanted to be worshiped as Lord. And so Domitian uh, mandated across the empire that everyone worship him, uh, Christians included. I think the only ones who got a pass were the Jews because their religion was ancient. And so that was respected. Christianity was seen as fairly new and no longer part of Judaism. And so Domitian didn't give the Christians kind of a pass on it. They had to offer sacrifice to him or risk persecution, risk being put to death. And so Domitian uh, died in 96, and so that was kind of the, the end of that for the time being. But during his reign, it was very intense and very challenging to be a Christian. John writes as one who is exiled because of his testimony to Christ, and he is on the island of Patmos, which is off the coast of Asia Minor. Uh, there's debate about which John this is. Uh, some say that it's John the Apostle. Others say it's a different John. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go with the traditional view that it is John the Apostle or the disciple John who is writing this. Uh, again, that's, that's one view among many, or maybe I should say a handful of views. Uh, your study Bible will kind of lay all that out for you. But the approach that we're taking is that it's written by John while he's exiled in Patmos or on the island of Patmos, and he's writing for the churches of Asia Minor. And it's taking place during the time that Domitian is the emperor. It's about 95 AD or AD 95. The purpose is to motivate faithfulness to Christ in the midst of a very dark and threatening time. And so as you read through Revelation, keep in mind always that this is John's purpose that everything he writes, it's to motivate faithfulness to Christ in the midst of such a threatening time of persecution to where being Christian could, could really cost you your life. Now we want to talk a little bit about genre. And Revelation is hard to grasp because we don't read very many things like it. And so it's kind of a combination of three genres put together. So on the one hand, it's very much like a letter. Uh, has a letter format in terms of who it's addressed to. It's addressed to the seven churches. It's from John, and it includes letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And so it's, it's very letter-like, and there is occasion and purpose to it. But it also falls under the genre of prophecy. Uh, prophecy was a spirit-inspired word from God, uh, to the churches about the impending future and how they need to live in the present. 
And so when you think prophecy, don't just think predicting the future. Uh, prophecy has to do with the future, but it's especially about how we are to live in the present because of the future that's coming. And so it's this prophetic word that John receives and, and speaks to the church or writes to the churches. And then the third aspect of genre is it's apocalyptic. And apocalyptic is a genre that is very strange to us, uh, but it's the idea that something is hidden, that's hidden is being revealed. And so Revelation reveals the victory of Jesus that is presently hidden. And so in the midst of the persecution, it looks like you know, the emperor wins. It looks like Jesus is defeated. The church is going to lose. And yet John reveals that Jesus is the victorious one. And so he reveals this victory that looks hidden. And in revealing the victory, lots of imagery and symbolism is used, a kind of out of this world stuff. And normally this type of literature is produced in times of persecution uh, when things are very, in, very intense. So we see this kind of literature, the second half of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. We see it in Zechariah a little bit, in Ezekiel a little bit, but probably Daniel, the second half, chapters 7 through 12 is where we see this type of imagery the most, although it shows up a few other places. And it's future oriented, you know, to where history is going, the goal of history, the end of history that God is bringing about. And again, in revealing it, the goal is to motivate faithfulness in the present. So the purpose of it is not really to map out every little thing that's going to happen centuries later. They feel like they're at the verge of the end of history. And it's, it looks very dark, very threatening, like everything's going to come to a close, that goodness is going to lose, God is going to lose, evil is going to prevail. And what happens in apocalyptic literature is it's revealed that no, God is over everything. God's in control of everything. God's in control of history and that God prevails, good prevails. Uh, and in Revelation, Jesus is the victorious one. So putting all this together, probably the most important thing, at least from my vantage point to remember, is that John writes as a pastor, that he is the pastor of these churches. Uh, he's very concerned with their well-being, and he writes with the goal of motivating faithfulness. He does not want to see his people compromise their faith and align themselves with a kingdom that's going to lose with Rome. Rome is temporary. He wants to motivate them to stay faithful, no matter how costly it might be, uh, to worship the Lord and be part of that kingdom, because that's the eternal kingdom. That's the permanent kingdom, God's kingdom. So he wants his people to know that Jesus is Lord, and that Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of worship. And the implication is that the emperor, Domitian, is not Lord. The emperor is not worthy of worship. And so don't bow down to him. Don't compromise your faith in Jesus just to keep yourself alive in this world. Uh, this world is passing and Rome is temporary and Domitian is especially temporary. So don't give in to that pressure. Stay faithful no matter how costly. It will be worth it that Jesus is the one who is worthy of our worship. And so that's a little bit of occasion and purpose, genre, again, key thing to keep in mind. John is writing as the pastor to these people, and his goal is to motivate them to stay faithful to Jesus, no matter what the cost. Now, at this point, we're going to go ahead and switch, and we are going to, let me stop this share. And we are going to just start reading Revelation together. So let me switch again to the text. Here we go. All right, so here we are in Revelation, and I'm working from the ESV. And we're going to read through this together. And then I'll talk a little bit more about it, not only as we go, but I'll have some places where I'll stop and summarize. And so the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. 
He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, you notice I highlight a few things. The first, the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's three things here I want to point out. Number one, notice that it's revelation. It's not revelations. Uh, so often I hear people refer to the book of Revelation as a book of revelations, like there's multiple revelations. No, there is just one revelation. And so please make note of that. Uh, take your S off the end of Revelations. It's always just one revelation. Second thing I want you to notice here, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this can be understood two ways. I think both are correct. So the first way is that Jesus Christ is the content of the revelation. So what's being revealed? Jesus. And in particular, the victory of Jesus. And so it's the revelation of Jesus and his victory. Again, one revelation, and the content of that revelation is Jesus and his victory, that Jesus reigns. Okay, and now the second way to take that, the third thing that I'm pointing out, is that Jesus is the source of the revelation, that God gave Jesus this revelation for Jesus to show to John and his servants, uh, Jesus' servants, what must soon take place. So Jesus is the content of the revelation, and Jesus is also the one who provides the revelation. Again, one revelation. Now we go on down just a little bit further, verse 3, and you see I have that highlighted. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So just want you to know, as I do this, I am being blessed. I'm reading it to you. And then second, blessed are those who hear. So as I read, not only am I the reader blessed, but you are blessed as those who are listening and hearing this revelation. Uh, the picture that this gives us is that John has sent this to his churches, and they're, for the most part, house churches. And so somebody's going to be reading this, and there's going to be a group of believers gathered around and listening. And so John is basically saying, blessed is the one who's reading, and blessed are all of you who are gathered up and listening and who keep what is written. Okay, we go on. Verse 4. Here's where we get kind of this letter format. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you. So kind of our normal, our normal letter format. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Now, look at uh, the first thing I highlighted in this greeting from him who is and who was and who is to come. Okay, this would be a reference to God. Notice we have kind of a Trinitarian formula here. Him who is, who was, and who is to come, that'd be God. From the seven spirits who are before his throne, that'd be a reference to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And then verse five, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So we got God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. Notice the order of this uh, in terms of who is, who was, who is to come. That is present, past, future. The normal order would be past, present, future. So the question is, why front load the present? So why from him who is and who was and who is to come instead of from who was and is and is to come, which we'll find in later places? Well, the emphasis on is is that God is God now, that God rules now, that God is sovereign now. Even though it's a very dark, chaotic time, even though there's intense persecution coming out of Rome, God is the one who is. Domitian is not. God is. And so by putting the order this way, by kind of front-loading the present, it's John's way of emphasizing that God is God even now. That God's not just at the beginning when everything starts. God's not just at the end when everything comes to a close. But even now, God is the one who is ruling. 
Okay, the seven spirits mentioned that already, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And then from Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, very important to pick up on this, that Jesus is identified first as a faithful witness, that he was faithful to the Father uh, at all costs. He did not compromise with the Jewish authorities. He did not compromise with the Roman authorities. He compromised with no one. He was faithful to the Father no matter what. So he was a faithful witness, but that cost him his life. He was crucified. Nonetheless, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Uh, he is resurrected. He was vindicated. And notice firstborn implies that there will be other born, that Jesus will have family, brothers and sisters who are raised from the dead. And then third, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, that he looked defeated, that everyone thought they were ridding the earth of Jesus, but instead he is resurrected and he is the one who actually rules. He's the victorious one over the kings of the earth. Now, this actually correlates with Christians. And so the faithful witness, that's what John's people are called to do, to be a faithful witness to Jesus, to not compromise no matter what it might cost them. And like it cost Jesus his life, it very well likely will cost them their lives. But Jesus was a firstborn from among the dead because of his faithful witness. And so the assurance to John's readers is that it may cost you your life, but you will be resurrected, that you will share in the resurrection. And then Jesus is the ruler of the kings on the earth. You will be resurrected to reign with Christ. And so you'll actually be victorious, even though from an earthly perspective, you were a fool for not worshiping the emperor. Uh, truth will be told, truth will be revealed that you are the victorious one and you will reign with Christ. Uh, we go on to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. Now, made us a kingdom, very important to pick up on this language, that for John, the believers really are a kingdom within the kingdoms of this world. Now, the only way I know how to think about this, uh, sometimes I hear people talk about Raiders Nation. Okay, hopefully you're not a Raiders fan, but I'm sure that at least one or two of you are. Um, but Raiders Nation, those are Raiders fans, and it doesn't matter what city they're in, it doesn't matter what city the Raiders are in, that they are going to be Raiders fans no matter where the Raiders are and no matter where they are. So they might live in San Diego. National City is full of Raiders fans. Uh, they might live up in the Bay Area. They might be in Los Angeles. They might be in Las Vegas. They might be somewhere on the East Coast or who knows where. Uh, but Raiders fans are Raiders nation uh, they are united around the, around the Raiders no matter what city they live in, whether it's where the Rams play, whether it's where the Niners are, doesn't matter. They are identified as Raiders nation. And so John wants Christians to kind of recognize that they are that way, that they are Jesus nation, that it doesn't matter who the emperor is, it doesn't matter who local authorities are, it doesn't matter what part of the Roman Empire they live in. Uh, no, they are Jesus' nation, and that Jesus made them a nation, made them a kingdom by his death on the cross and uniting them in his blood and the forgiveness that they know and the mission that they have. And so, so they are Jesus' nation. And when it speaks in verse 7 about Jesus coming, and every eye will see him, and those who, including all those who pierced him, rejected him, all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. This word wail, it's the idea of gasping. Like they just can't believe it. Like we thought he was dead. We thought we didn't need to worry about him. And now they see him coming. Now they see he, he's alive. Now they see he is victorious. And it's just this gasp that we were wrong. And 
woe unto us, what are we going to do? So, so you begin to see kind of how John is already setting this up, uh, that there are a kingdom that belongs to Jesus in the midst of the Roman Empire. And the challenge is to live loyal to Jesus. He is the worthy one. Uh, he is the one who truly rules and not the emperor. So don't compromise and worship the emperor. Uh, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna, to Pergamum and to Thyatira, and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And these are all churches located in Asia Minor. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, there's a lot of symbolism in here, and I want us to walk through it uh, kind of quick. Uh, most of this symbolism comes from the Old Testament, a lot of it from the book of Daniel. But the golden lampstands, as Jesus identifies and uh, makes known, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so you have a world full of darkness, but everywhere there's a church, that church is like a lampstand in the midst of the darkness. And then standing in the midst of the lampstands, John sees one like a son of man. That's Jesus. So Jesus is standing in the midst of his seven churches in the midst of this dark world in which they're facing extreme persecution. So Jesus is in their midst. How does Jesus appear? Well, he's clothed with a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. And so that would be royal and priestly garb. And so Jesus is the king. Jesus is also priestly. Uh, the hairs of his head were white like wool or like snow. Um, that would symbolize kind of, in one sense, old age, that Jesus has been around forever, eternity, and also wisdom that Jesus is the one who rules with true wisdom. Uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire. And so this would represent Jesus' ability to kind of see through all the deceit and that he sees exactly what's going on and he brings justice with these eyes of fire, okay? And he can look through, stare down anybody and know what's right and what's wrong. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. Okay, feet of bronze, this is in contrast to um, a dream in Daniel chapter, oh, I want to say it's chapter two, that Nebuchadnezzar had that Daniel interprets to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the Babylonians, uh, has this dream where the head of the statue is gold and then the chest is silver and and you work your way down from gold to silver, and eventually you get down to feet that are made of clay and iron mixed in, and they're brittle. And so you have these kind of glorious kingdoms, but they are going to be toppled over because their feet are made of clay and iron. They're brittle. They, they're, they can't provide the stability necessary. Okay, Jesus, burnished bronze feet. What's being said? Jesus' kingdom will not be toppled. 
that his throne is permanent, that there is no way you're going to topple Jesus. Uh, he is the everlasting king. So his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters, comparable to God's voice and the power that's in the rushing waters. His right hand, in his right hand, he held the seven stars. Now this kind of goes a couple of ways, seven stars in ancient times, the heavenly bodies or stars were worshiped, uh, astrology, okay? But Jesus has them in his hands or has them in his right hand. And so no power that Jesus has control of the heavenly bodies of the stars. And so you don't need to wor worry about worshiping stars and planets. Jesus has them all under control. So in his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, the two-edged sword would represent his word and his testimony. And so the word of God is regarded as a sword. It's through the word that Christians are victorious. But it's also a reference, I think, to his testimony, which we've seen men mentioned already, that you are victorious your weapon is your word that when you speak the truth, when you confess Christ as Lord, then you are going to be victorious uh, rather than cave in. And then his face was like the sun shining in full strength, just glorious. Okay, oh, and the other thing that the seven stars represent would be the seven angels of the seven churches. And so each church kind of has an angel watching over it and Jesus communicates through that angel to the churches which we'll see next. Okay, so let me go ahead and and shift screens again here to a screen that summarizes. So just bear with me here. We'll stop this share and we will go to this share. Sure. Okay, so here are a couple of screens that just summarize what I covered in Revelation 1. So notice it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is one revelation, not revelations, plural that the revelation content is Jesus and his victory. And then the source of the revelation is Jesus. Jesus is the giver of the revelation. So there's one revelation and the revelation, the content of the revelation is Jesus and his victory. And the source of the revelation is also Jesus. Uh, mentioned from him who is and who was and who is to come. That this is a reference to God the Father, and to note the order that the emphasis is on the present, the one who is. The God is God now, even in this time of chaos and persecution. Also highlighted that Jesus is the faithful witness, even though this cost Jesus his life. He was faithful. He refused to compromise with the uh, worldly authorities, regardless of who they were. That Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Uh, God vindicated him and raised him, and notice firstborn, so Jesus will have family from among the dead as well. And then Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth, that he's the victorious one, that he looked defeated, but God raised him, and God established the kingdom of Jesus, so Jesus is the one who truly rules. Made us a kingdom, we are Jesus' nation amidst the kingdoms of this earth. And that Jesus is coming and all the tribes of the earth will wail or gasp at his coming. Uh, they will realize how wrong they were about Jesus. And then we looked at the vision of Jesus. We saw the symbolism, the seven lampstands equals the seven churches. And Jesus is standing in the midst of them in this dark world. Uh, Jesus holds the stars in his hands. Jesus is superior uh, to all of those heavenly bodies. And Jesus is also superior to the angels. They do his bidding. Uh, Jesus has a gold sash around him in this robe, royalty, um, probably also priestly, I should add, but Jesus is the king. Uh, white hair would symbolize age and wisdom, kind of eternity and wisdom. Flaming eyes, he sees through lies, he brings justice. 
His feet are like burnished bronze, so he has stability. He cannot be toppled. His voice is like roaring waters, powerful, God's voice, a two-edged sword from his mouth, his testimony, he was faithful, and the word of God. And then the shining face is the glory of God, and the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Okay, so, so that's kind of chapter one. Now we're going to move into chapters two and three. In chapters two and three, we get the letters to the seven churches. So chapters two and three, we get the letters to the seven churches. Let me keep sharing, the, get the right screen up here for you. Okay, so now we continue on in chapter two and three, and you'll see what I have highlighted as we go. Uh, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Now you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. So what we see in this letter, we're going to see over and over again. And so let me just highlight a couple things. First of all, it always starts out to the angel or to the messenger of the church in whatever the city is. And then the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. Okay, who is that? That's Jesus. And so some aspect of the vision of Jesus is highlighted at the beginning of each letter. And so the words of Jesus uh, is, is what's being recorded, okay? And here it emphasizes that he holds the seven stars and that he walks among the seven gold lampstands that he's present. Next thing, Jesus knows. Uh, I know your works. I know where you're at. I know your struggles. I know what you're doing. Uh, I know. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake. Jesus knows his churches, okay? But he also knows where they're struggling and even where they're failing. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. And so Jesus calls them to repent, probably should have highlighted that word. So Jesus knows them, knows what they're doing well, but he also knows what they're doing poorly. And so he calls them to repentance. And then you'll see this phrase, the Nicolaitans. We don't know tons about them, but probably in some way they compromised with the Roman Empire. Compromised in terms of worshiping the emperor, compromised in some manner. And so Jesus hates their works, their works of compromise. And this church does too, the church in Ephesus. Now, finally, every letter ends with a promise. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, very important to get this. What conquering looks like is you're going to conquer the temptation to compromise. That means you're going to be faithful, even if it costs you your life. So it's kind of ironic that by conquering, by overcoming, you might actually be put to death. Conquering doesn't mean that you're going to somehow win in court. Conquering doesn't mean that somehow you're going to escape with your life. What conquering means is that you are going to be faithful no matter the cost. You will conquer the temptation, overcome the temptation uh, to give in and to, to survive and compromise with Rome. No, you're going to overcome that. You're going to conquer that even if it costs you your life. And the promise is, when you do that, resurrection, you will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
and you will have eternal life, you will reign. So every, every one of these letters ends with some type of promise to those who conquer, those who are faithful and don't give in to, to temptation to compromise, ends with a promise of resurrection life, eternal life, reigning with Christ. Okay, let's see. I think that's all I want on that one. Well, maybe one more thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you wear Nikes, but the word Nike comes from the Greek word nikeo, which is the word that conquering or overcoming comes from. And so maybe to help you think about this, what does it look like to overcome? Uh, well, I guess every time you see Nikes and you see that swoosh stripe, you can think, okay, the one who really conquers is not the one wearing Nikes, but the one who really conquers is the one who is faithful in the face of pressure to compromise, that you stay faithful to Christ no matter what the pressure is. That's what overcoming looks like. That's what, that's what, uh, what wearing Nikes really looks like. That's victory right there. So uh, anyways, kind of just a little thing. Whenever you see the swish stripe, think about what it means to actually be victorious, to actually overcome the temptation to compromise, to cave in to the pressures of the world. Okay, verse eight, second letter. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty. There's that I know again, but you are rich in the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, a synagogue of Satan uh, means that they're a place where they have com compromised with the emperor, that Domitian is kind of identified here as Satan. Uh, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation for a span. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, that's the one who is faithful unto death, will not be hurt by the second death because he will receive the crown of life. Uh, next letter. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Okay, again, Jesus. I know where you dwell. Oh, I should have had that I know highlighted. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So already there is a martyr uh, among, the, among this church and Jesus knows. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Again, you see Jesus knows, Jesus calling for repentance, Jesus encouraging them to overcome with the promise of life. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality the food sacrifice to idols. Now, the sexual immorality that is uh, talked about here, mentioned here, it's probably not literally sexual immorality, although I guess it could be, but it probably is, especially in terms of, uh, of compromising with Rome and worshiping the emperor. And so it's, it's pretty vivid language to talk about compromise and betrayal. And so it's like you're, you're cheating on Jesus by worshiping the emperor and that that's taking place in this church and they're eating food sacrificed to idols. They're participating in the worship of the emperor, even though they call themselves Christians. And so 
people are being seduced into doing that. Okay, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality, her compromising with Rome. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their of her works. Oh, by the way, Jezebel is known from the Old Testament. She was a uh, the wife of King Ahaz, excuse me, Ahab, and she worshiped Baal. And so that's why Jezebel, that name is brought up here. Okay, uh, and I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, the deep, deep things of Rome, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and he who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. You'll reign with Christ, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. So here's a church that really has a great reputation, but needs to do a lot of repenting and a, a lot of transformation needs to take place. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To the church in Philadelphia and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now finally, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay, I know that's a lot to go through and that there is, uh, you know, we could again, spend lots of time going over each one, but let me summarize it for you.
So here we have the basic pattern of the letters to the seven churches. To the angel of the church write the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus says, I know where you are, what you're up against. I know how you're doing. I know the changes that you need to make. And he calls some of them to repent. But remember, Jesus is in the midst of the seven lampstands. Jesus knows exactly what's going on with his churches and what they're facing. And so Jesus offers encouragement to them to continue to persevere, to continue to be faithful. He applauds some of them for their faithfulness, but then he also calls for repentance wherever repentance is needed, and especially calls out those who are compromising with Rome in some kind of way. He knows the pressure to compromise, but he's not going to accept compromise. And so he calls for them to repent and to worship him completely, to be faithful. And then the promise to the one who is victorious, there is the promise of resurrection, the promise of reigning with Christ. That, and so we need to remember that victory is staying faithful, even if it means your death. That's what it means to overcome. And no matter how much pressure, you're not going to cave in to that pressure, to that temptation to worship the emperor, to compromise your faith in some kind of way. Okay, let me go ahead and end this one, and then I'm going to come back, and we'll take a look at the throne room scene. So we'll put this one, uh, we'll close this one off, and then we'll come back and we'll look at chapters four and five, and maybe get into six. We will see.